this is Angela Zender, and this is yet again another live Tuesday Connections webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. What I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to start um, a webinar to be live on Facebook for those of, for the people who aren't able to join us on Zoom right now. We're just going to share it on Facebook because last week we had about half of our people watching on Zoom and the other half was watching on Facebook. We want to be able to reach as many people as we can because we feel that this message is important and we want people to be able to hear it. So in just a minute or two, Dr. Ray and Jean will be on. And the topic for tonight is concerning anxiety. So yes, that is a uh, quite a broad topic, I would say. You know, one thing you could think about is in what ways does your anxiety manifest? Also answer the question of, do you have anxiety or not? Was there a certain time in your life when you were more anxious? Are there people around you who identify as being anxious or not? And what does anxiety mean, right? So we're gonna talk about it, talk about you know, our own thoughts and experiences with anxiety, but also what the research says and what certain theorists and books say about anxiety, right? And also it varies among cultures and societies, right? So just think right now about how your family thought of anxiety and where you might have learned it from. Hello, Dr. Ray and Jean. Hey, Hello, Ange. Angela. How are you? I'm doing lovely. Thank you. At the moment, um, we are just uh, loading as we're going live on Facebook. Okay, that sounds good. We're just testing cameras, angles, and everything too. Hey, so I, I think that's perfect. So I did set up everyone so far with what the topic will be tonight. It's concerning mm -hmm. anxiety. And I know that I'll be a big part of this. I'm just gonna take a couple more minutes away from the screen to make sure we get the Facebook Live running and then I'll come back and jump in. Does Sounds that good. Sense? Sounds good. Okay. So today we want to talk about anxiety, which, what's your statistics that you got on that? It is the most common mental illness in the United States. 40 million Americans wow. suffering from anxiety. You know, the interesting thing about anxiety is it affects us, not just emotionally, it affects us physically and it affects our thinking mm -hmm. and, it, and it's all wrapped together. And so we are able to via this biofeedback system and really rev ourselves up. And then we get kind of stuck in that fight, flight, or freeze. And it actually feels more uncomfortable to release it, to let it go. It's a really difficult thing to uh, try to balance. I think in our experience, the people dedicated for anxiety are the least compliant. So anxiety specifically is something that we need, mm -hmm. right? We have worry, we have fear, we have sadness, we have all of those emotions for a reason. And anxiety is just one of them. It serves a function. Mm -hmm. You know, as species on this planet develop, they all start with the emotion of fear. And then as human beings, we have evolved to have a multitude of emotions, anxiety and worry being one yeah, of them. Yeah, anxiety is like pay attention, something's not right. It helps us prepare mm -hmm. for something in the future. It helps us prepare for any type of threats that might be in our environment. And so, you know, when our brain starts searching for threats in the environment, it doesn't have a dimmer switch. It's just on or off. And so it's just constantly going to be, you know, searching and searching until it finds a threat. And then once that threat is neutralized or it goes away, then it continues to search. It searches for other threats. And so it, it doesn't really turn off unless we actively turn it off. Mm -hmm. And so it's very, it's not surprising that it is the most common mental illness that Americans suffer from, right. anxiety disorders, right? And there's a multitude of them and we're not gonna get into all of the different ones, but you know, 
it's not a surprise because we are just bombarded by so much stimuli. We're bombarded by media. We're bombarded by, you know, all these types of threats, you know, that our brain can't distinguish uh, between a, a tiger jumping out of the bushes or you just got a, a bill from the IRS. Right. right. And so when you're dealing with anxiety, there is so many coping skills that you can use and all of them work some of the time and some of the time, none of them work. <laughs> and that's a really hard part about anxiety because we all have it. We all experience it at some level and it, it hijacks us like very quickly when we go through it. I remember sometimes we're public speaking and I'll just be la 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 and then. And then uh, you just forget, just <laughs> blank out, right? And it's, it's funny to watch your mind just go, hmm gone just gone right it's so funny and you know, I don't know if you've ever had anything really anxiety producing like public speaking or you know maybe a sporting event or something that you're in and it is it's so hard to control it and actually it's much worse when you're thinking about it and right before you're about to do it and once you do it once you're in the middle of whatever that behavior event is you don't notice it but all that adrenaline rush I think helps you perform better so in some ways it's beneficial. It can, mm -hmm. it, it can until or unless that like throttle gets stuck open. And so if it gets stuck open and you're not able to calm yourself down and start that parasympathetic uh, nervous system response and just calm and relax yourself, then you'll just start jumping from one thing to the other to find yourself even more ramped up and even even more anxious. And that's that's typically how a panic attack starts, right? Is that it starts with the thinking and then your body takes over the physiological responses that, you know, your body starts pumping the adrenaline as you're talking about heart rate, uh, you know, accelerates, respiration accelerates, you know, blood pressure increases. And so with those, that biofeedback system, your body giving you, your brain that signal that you are having this type of a response, it, it increases that response. It's interesting to listen to you talk because people are different and we're all sort of on this bell-shaped curve and we can respond to anxiety in several different ways, right? Some people get really agitated and talk really fast and, and rev themselves up, but some people do the opposite. Some people go into hide or freeze mode. Right. And I'm more of the freeze mode. You're more of the ramp or upper mode. Mm. And so it's a little bit different. So in, in the middle of something that is very anxiety producing, I will look very calm. And, um, and even almost like I don't care, but it's just a different way that I learn to respond to things. And maybe there is some of that that's a little hardwired, you know, that we, we have a temperament like that, maybe even at birth. You know, it's, it's always interesting when you have more than one kid and you see, even right from the beginning, you know, some babies sleep, some babies don't, some eat regularly, some don't, some are easier to soothe, some are not. Mm -hmm. And that's all part of that system. And so uh, I think that's why everyone has to learn themselves. Yes. What works for them, what doesn't work for them. And, and not just kind of run to a quick fix, you know, meaning run for medication, right? And I'm not saying that medication isn't necessary. It absolutely is, you know, but I think that too often what we do is we try to just get rid of what we're feeling instead of trying to understand why we're feeling it and where it's coming from. I think that's an important thing to talk about because that's not the function of medication. <laughs> yep. Medication's job is not to stop you from feeling. It can take the edge off, but you know, for some people, they need medication to do the work. But if you just take medication, and you don't do the work. That's when you need more and more and more. Because it's that's not the function of it. The function of it is to, to get you to a certain point where then you can activate the, the way you talk to yourself and, and your breathing and your exercise and your sleep and your diet and all those other kind of things that are going to help you. It, 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 there's a reason why it is the number one mental uh, illness mm -hmm. issue in, in America. And, you know, that is because, you know, we, we have it hardwired in us. Mm -hmm. And so we all can have that kind of an anxiety response to our environment and stressors. We just 
don't really know the best way to deal with it. We all have not evolved to a point of dealing with, you know, the, the fast paced world that we have now. Our brain is, has not evolved, has not evolved to match, you know, the, uh, the media and the, and the fast paced stimuli that we receive. And so that's why we're just, we're playing catch up all the time. You know, and, you know, we've talked about slowing down. We've talked about really just kind of taking a step back, maybe turning off media, turning off, you know, everything that you're being bombarded with so that you can really start to connect within. Mm -hmm. And that's really where it starts is understanding about your own stress response. Yeah. A really interesting way to understand that is music. I mean, if you walk into a room and there's classical music playing, that's going to impact your nervous system very differently than, um, a pop song or a heavy metal song or jazz or something else. It, everything is going to evoke a different like emotion within us that is going to sh- change us. And so that's an important thing to know about yourself. There's some people that absolutely feel much calmer with the heavy thrashing music. And some people feel very anxiety produced when there's classical music. Mm-hmm. It just sort of depends. I always think about anxiety, like having a passenger in your car. Um, are they sitting next to you telling you how to drive are they in the back seat are they in the trunk are they driving they're not going away are they sitting on top of the roof <laughs> right <laughs> and so you get to choose how much you're going to let that impact what you do in your life and actually the more behaviors you choose that reinforce your anxiety the stronger your anxiety becomes and the more you combat those things the more you push through the anxiety and do behaviors that you're anxious about, the more of the edge that's going to come on. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You know, um, and we, um, you've had some personal experience with, you know, kind of battling anxiety. I wonder if you wanted to kind of talk a little bit about that. We're going to have a discussion about that. I would love to. Now, what I would really love is if we're able to get both of us on the screen at the same time. Who knows? That might work. Um, okay. But if not, then it'll that be work? speaker view. I see both of us. So okay, hopefully. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yes. So you said battle with anxiety. Um, yes, I would say part of my credibility as an anxiety coach is that I've had my own experiences with it and I feel much better with how I've managed it. One thing that I would love to talk about is this sort of experiment I did, and it was called 30 Days of Crushing It. I did this back a few years ago, like in 2018, and exactly what you two were saying about um, how we have the tendency to avoid things that we're afraid of, right, Um, that we think will be bad you know, whatever that means. And I was saying, you know, I do a lot of avoiding, but I also have a lot of goals for myself. So why don't I make a rule for myself? And that rule was going to be that for 30 days, I would do something that made me anxious every day. Now, do you think that was easy or hard? Uh, I think pretty difficult. Hmm, that's interesting. I, I'm going to go with, uh, if you got structured and disciplined and focused, that the, the vague anxiety would be less, but the immediate, like chronic, intense anxiety would be more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, so I would say it was a mix. Yeah. So the first step is, huh, are there going to be... 30 days worth of things that make me anxious? And the answer is yes. If you, especially if you are a, an anxious person, you know, again, whatever that means, because we all have different levels of anxiety or stress in our life. So if you have some kind of anxiety in your life right now, I would guess that you could wake up tomorrow and choose to do at least one thing that you were nervous about right? One thing that you could avoid, but that was the rule. I was not supposed to avoid something. I was going to do it. Mm -hmm. And what I like to say when I talk about the 30 days of crushing it is I did not let my anxiety or fear stop me 
the rule was, I'm going to wait to see how I feel until afterwards, right? <laughs> After that activity, that was the rule. Um, people who are successful in academics, they're quite good at following rules, right? Uh, Jean, would you say people in the military tend to be good at following rules? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's that discipline. You can't let your emotions dictate and mm -hmm. you just have to do what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. So, yeah. So I would say, you know, you can always, for me, it was helpful to frame it as a rule for myself, right? Yeah. That's because my husband and you two, no one else was keeping me accountable. Like no one else was saying, Ange, for 30 days, you better do something that makes you anxious, right? So it was for myself. So would you like to know some of the things I did during that 30 days? Well, before you go to that, and I, I just want to say that's a really great way of setting it up because you allowed yourself to be able to experience the anxiety, but you just told yourself when you would be able to do that. So <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, having anxiety be the passenger, but you're saying, but I'm going to drive. Okay. And so that, yeah. that's really great, great way to frame it and be in control you know, throughout the whole process. Did you let anyone know that you were doing this when you were doing it? I would say I at least let my husband know. I lived with him and, you know, I like to share things about my day with him. So I told him, I don't know if I told anyone else. You didn't Did tell you us. Did you know? No. No. Every, every now and then you would say that, oh, I just did this thing, but we didn't know you were doing this 30 day thing or anything like that. Mm. And, and I still don't know all the things that you did. Like, so I don't, I'm learning today too. So what are some of the highlights? Okay. So, um, well, I'll start with the, well, I'll start with what I remember because I don't remember the full 30 days, but um, I don't know if I'd call them highlights, but I remember on my first day, because we tend to remember the first and last of things. On my first day, I posted a picture on Facebook. Now, I still say that with some kind of nerves, right? Some kind of sensation in my body, because a lot of people listening to this are wondering, what the heck? You can't post something on social media? Of course, I've been nervous about their judgments, right? But that's what I did. Um, I feel like there are other people out there that would agree. It's a little nerve wracking to post a selfie on social media. It's something that at least I've heard you say, Jean, before is you're not just posting in, you know, to your whatever, your best friends, right? It's like, it's like if I shout something and my best friend here hears it, but also my in-laws are hearing it and the co-worker that I worked with five years ago is hearing it and, you know, all these other people, my cousins and all this, right? So that's so many people that could judge you. I right? can only imagine and that's, if you were like posting live or something on Facebook. That would be <laughs> so stressful. Right. And talking oh about it. God. Yeah. Oh so, okay. So that's what I did. And then there were other things, some things I had no plans for. Right. Again, you wake up in the morning. Uh, I live in the city and I had not wanted to ride a bike because the city can be a crowded place. I, it's, I think it's dangerous enough to be a pedestrian sometimes, <laughs> right? With all these cars going by. But uh, I've wanted to ride a bike because I find that there's some joy in actually doing that. So that, that was one of my 30 days. I rented a bike because you can do that in the city and I rode it around. Another thing I did, which was quite difficult, was go out to eat by myself. Again, oh, what do you think? A lot of people have a lot of issues with mm -hmm. that, yeah. Yeah, so what do you think stops them? Why do they have issues? Well, you know, I think that it's that self-consciousness, you know, thinking that other people are gonna be thinking about them and, you know, feeling sorry for them that they don't have someone to eat with or, you know, all yeah. of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would I would group all that into judgment, right? Thinking you're going to get negative judgment from either people you know or a lot of people you don't know. So um, one thing I reminded myself of when I went out to eat by myself was 
no restaurant has a rule that there's only two people or more that are allowed to sit down and, you know, and pay for our services and our food, right? So I'm like, that's just a silly thing that I made up in my mind. And I do always love when I see other people dining alone. They, you know, they seem like confident people to me. They bring something to do. And what was important about dining alone was another rule on that rule was I could not distract myself with my cell phone. It'd be so easy to pull out the smartphone, right? And I, I think people do this all the time, right? Because we want to avoid I don't know, looking weird or negative judgments again. So uh, so it was a little difficult because I wanted to avoid this situation by going on my phone, but I didn't. So that, I did that. That's an interesting point because you said that when you see people dining alone, they seem more confident. Mm-hmm. But the, the thing I hear before someone's done it is people are going to think I'm a loser. Like I have yeah. no friends and and it's actually the opposite of what people think. And like, who cares what people think? But that's interesting, that projection that we do. Yes. And I would say what's similar to that is something I did on another day is working out publicly. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> you, if you got like, you guys live in the suburbs, right? So you probably, you see people working out, running around the block, right? Or running in the forest preserves or, you know, hiking. So um, in the city, there's tons of that too. So I just have never really been the working out in public, like, you know, going out for a jog or something for lots of reasons. But one is thinking, you know, people will think poorly of me. Um, And, you know, what you wear too, like it could get a little self-conscious, right? Like, oh, I'm supposed to be in workout clothes and there's all these strangers and I'm alone. It's, that's where it's more, it turns into more primal fear sometimes, right? Like, should I be a woman out when it's a little dark outside in the city running alone, you know? So with all of those things said, Um, I went out and I started jogging, which, you know, I, I followed my gut when it came to, you know, uh, being light outside still and being close to my home and wearing what I felt comfortable in. So uh, that went fine. I I would say that went well, right? Um, I say it was similar to the last one, because if I see people working out, I don't think about them for longer than a minute afterwards. I don't go home, think, oh, what is that person doing? Why were they wearing that, right? (laughs) So the same thing, they weren't, nobody was thinking about me afterwards. Yeah, that's interesting. Like I I think I'm self-conscious doing yoga at, at the gym, which is where people work out, but like people only kind of do yoga in a yoga class. It is, that's an interesting thing that the anxiety producing things that we have. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, we can make anything anxiety producing. <laughs> <laughs> now, I understand you did something really extreme though. Well, um, I, yes, would you like me to get there? Yeah, but I have to tell you the steps before it, okay? okay. So, because um, this, I would say it's an important thing. So one of my 30 days was, I made plans to do something that, you know, Ray calls extreme, right? So that meant my thing for the day was scheduling something, right? So for me, it was online. I had to click a button and, you know, probably pay for it. And I really like to give that some kind of praise or power because that's the first step towards doing anything new or big, right? You think about like taking a big trip, right? It's not like all of a sudden you're in Italy, right? No, there was planning that went into it. At one point in time, you had to buy a flight, right? One point in time, you had to pick what hotel you were gonna stay at. You know, you had to pick maybe attractions you were gonna see. Um, You had to save money for that ride or that flight, whatever. So you had to do something before that big trip was accomplished. 
so similar for this thing, right? That was my first step. I didn't avoid it by not clicking or saying, I don't want to spend the money. This was something I wanted to do for a while. I knew it was going to be like physically anxiety provoking, but I've known other people who've done it. And I was just like, why not? Why haven't I done it yet? So my husband was like, I'm anxious. I don't want you to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Which the people pleaser in me, I don't like that he was feeling anything other than good about it, right? But I also explained to him, well, although you don't feel great about it, I do. And I'm not doing this for you. I'm doing it for me. So all of that in the rest of my 30 days went exactly how they were supposed to. I did some days of um, doing something for my anxiety. Like I'm going to rest today and I'm not going to regret it. I'm not going to beat myself up for it, right? I'm going to take a nice hot bath with lavender Epsom salts. So there were a couple other things that were not anxiety provoking, but to better manage general anxiety. On the 30th day, I went skydiving. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my thing. So, and it was great as I expected it to be. And my body did not react in a super stressful way like I thought it would. I would still call that extreme. <laughs> was there any okay. time during the 30 days that you pushed yourself through your anxiety to do a behavior that was anxiety producing that you regretted? No, because you'd think I'd remember that, right? But no, I don't remember any such thing. I don't, reg I don't regret not mm -hmm. doing anything. Yeah. It, you know, I, I like the fact that the way you approached the anxiety was to go internal, right? Is to face it head on within yourself. And too often what people do with anxiety is they go external is that if I feel this way on the inside, then I need to control everything outside of my environment and make that so that I don't feel that anxiety. <laughs> and so now they're controlling their home, they're controlling their, their relationship, their spouse, controlling their kids. You know, then they want to make sure that the work environment fits, you know, their anxiety so that now they're just, you know, mitigating everything mm -hmm. so that they don't have those symptoms which actually makes everything worse because what you're doing then is hardwiring your brain to believe that if you have control out here, then you're going to be okay, but it's impossible to have control out here. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely impossible. Right. You have control over how you respond to what's mm -hmm. happening out there. And so what you were talking about, Angie is awesome because you, you did some things that are really important. You were very deliberate. You were conscious. You talk about planning, right? Because anxiety is really, really reactive. And if you react, then you let that get the best of you and you will not do anything in your life that, that is meaningful or, or a little um, exciting or scary. And it's when we do those new things that we rewire our brain and feel more confident and good in the world. That's why I asked if you felt bad about anything you did and you're like, no. And it will always no. give you that. And it's instant, right? Like probably the day you went skydiving, you were probably like super you know, excited for the rest of the day, just a, a big high that you're on and not, not an anxiety one. Right. <laughs> and I, what I would add to all this talk about the 30 days is a lot of things I mentioned were uh, physical things, right? So that's not just what makes people anxious, right? One of the things that I surprised myself that I did, um, it was more on the emotional track there was someone in my life that um, I have not spoken to in a very long time for many, many reasons. Neither one of us spoke to each other. So one of these days, in those 30 days, I was thinking, oh, I want to contact that person. But I was, I was afraid to call them up. So I, I messaged them, you know, sort of like a text. Yeah. So Oh, however it was, however I communicated online with them, you know, I messaged them. And then the next day I had enough guts to just call them. And then we had a phone conversation, the first one in like 10 years. 
I mean, if that's not a step towards healing and a step towards forgiving and a step towards letting go of some past, you know, argument or whatever, you know, this was a mutual hurt that neither one of us did it to each other, but because of a mutual hurt, we didn't have any interest in talking to each other, right? But like that, just the step of first thinking about them, reaching out to them one way, it just led me to giving them a call. And I broke the ice on that one. And I would you, say it's awesome. Let me ask you this, Angie, if it had not turned out that way, let's say you didn't get a good reaction from the other person, yeah. would it still have been worth it? I, 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 um, I see the complication in that question, right? because I got the, the better side, uh, you know, the better response. I would like to say it would still be worth it. I wouldn't beat myself up over it, but that's a discussion to have with my brain at that time, mm -hmm. you know, to feel the, the hurt or rejection or anger yeah. and still remind myself that I had the good intention and I don't regret it. See, that's the hard part when, when we are making a goal, you know, for ourselves, and it involves someone else, you know, it's an unpredictable element. We don't know how other people are going to react, you know, like if you had told a lot of people, you know, hey, I'm going skydiving, I'm sure you would have gotten a plethora of responses from people. And that might have, you for know, sure. maybe deterred, you know, you're yeah. not doing it, right? And so th this is, I mean, this is the, the one person part. that knew didn't want her to do That's it. That's right. The one person <laughs> who knew, didn't want her to do it. you know, and, and this is the tricky part about facing your anxiety. And that is that, you know, it does, a, you have to do a lot of self-discovery mm -hmm. and you have to really dig deep into what your truth is, right. And what your authenticity is, because if you're not connected with that, then it'd be very easy to be pulled off course by what other people think and what other people's opinions are, whether you should or shouldn't, right? And, and then I, I think also it's a lot harder for you to let go of what the reaction is of other people, what the response is. And, and even if it's not other people, it's very hard for you to let go of the outcome, right? You know, getting on stage, if you're able to face that fear, you get on stage and, you know, you're like, yay, but you performed horribly, <laughs> you still have to be able to let go of the outcome of that, right? So that you can move on and really focus in on, on challenging that anxiety, challenging that fear. And that's really what the goal is. The goal isn't, you know, the outcome. It reminds me of like a race you know, and they say, get ready. And you put yourself in this position and get set. And you're like, and then you don't do it. And, and you just stay in that place of I'm just set. I'm so tension. anxious, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then if you just go, it resolves. But if you never go, you go back and, you know, like diving, jumping off a diving board, that's really high. Instead of jumping, you like crawl back down the ladder. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. I see what you're saying. And one thing, uh, let's take one question before we, you know, start meditation and wrap up. Oh, but before we take the question, I wanted to add, um, Bray, what you were saying, uh, like the example of being on stage or let's say, um, jumping off of the high diving board. Mm -hmm. I think people who have a certain level of anxiety, they are so worried that they won't survive it. And again, whatever survive to them means, right? Yeah. So I would like to think that someone with high anxiety, once they come off of that stage, even after a less than perfect performance, they are going to feel much better because it was a confirmation that they were able to survive it. Look, they're not dead or they're not, yeah. I don't know, horribly scarred. I don't know you know, people are so afraid of things, you know, negative judgment, and they, they chalk it up to this idea of actual survival. So, I, so I if you can a, actually do it, you'll remind yourself you'll yeah. survive. I want to add a caveat to that because mm -hmm. I have a real world example here. 
I, I use the example of getting on stage for reasons. I actually have a fear of being on stage. Oh. I, I do. I'm not joking. And it's that's surprising, surprising that's yeah. That from when I was five years old, I was part of a, a violin troupe and we performed in orchestra hall in, in downtown Chicago. And this, is, uh, if you don't know Chicago and, and orchestra hall, this is where Chicago Symphony Orchestra performed. So it was a really awesome honor to do this. And I was on stage, I was in the front row of all the other kids and we were supposed to stand there with our violins ready. And then when we got the signal from our conductor, we would put our violins up in ready position. Well, my parents were out in the, in the uh, audience and they were waving to me. And so I was waving at them and saying hi. And I missed the cue for putting the violins up in ready position. So everyone was ready with their violins and I was still waving at my parents like this. The entire orchestra hall erupted in laughter. Aww. And I realized that they were <laughs> laughing at me. Okay. Aww. So since yeah. five years old, I mean, that's, you know, very young age. And so, you know, this is very important for people to understand is no matter how many times I get up in front of an audience, no matter times I am doing Facebook live or, you know, right before going to Facebook live, our camera goes on the fritz and we can't <laughs> get them to go. So, you know, no matter what happens, right, there is still an anxiety response. So you're always going to have this knee-jerk reaction, you know, to whatever it is that had produced that anxiety response early on. Now you can work at it and you can continue to, to kind of smooth over the rough edges, but you need to realize that there is always going to be that little bit of a knee-jerk response. And, you know, you, you build some coping mechanisms around it. You force yourself, you get yourself back, you know, in facing that fear over and over again. Okay, but it's never going to totally go away. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that, that's just really important for people to know, because I think people yeah. think, oh, I, 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 I can't do this. I'm, I'm not perfect, right? I keep making this mistake over and over and over and over again. And then they give up. And it's not about giving up. It's about learning more and more about yourself each time you face that challenge. I agree. Okay, thank you for sharing. You know, before we go into meditation, we want to talk a little bit about your your anxiety group. Oh, uh, sh sh let's see if this question super quick. Oh yeah, yeah, go ahead. Quick as we can. Okay, so somebody says I have a parent who is not stable and did not call me for my birthday. Mm -hmm. Their birthday is coming up, and it's getting me a little nervous. I have a lot of mixed emotions going on and feel heartbroken. What should I do? It's a great question. <laughs> you know, I think birthdays are a great example of feeling that, that exposure and vulnerability and we have expectations and those expectations are, they come from lots of places, how we were treated as children and all those kind of things. And, you know, I remember my 30th birthday and I was li living alone and, didn't really have any one to celebrate with. And I remember thinking like, do I make my own cake? And that day I decided that I was going to own my birthday. I was going to do what I wanted for myself, take really good care of myself. And, and that I wasn't really gonna celebrate my birthday with anyone else ever again, unless it was something I wanted. And I do that. And, and sometimes my mom doesn't like it cause she wants to see me on my birthday, but I still be selfish on my birthday. People will absolutely let you down, but you know what? Someone else, someone else that you don't expect at all is going to acknowledge you in a way that feels really great. And so I think that there's an openness that you can get to where you can sort of forgive those that have let you down, but also really appreciate those who at that moment have, have stepped into that. But most importantly, meet your own needs. Yeah, and if you meet your own needs, then anything that is coming towards you from other people is only going to be a, a bonus, mm -hmm. right? And so, you, you know, when you think about that scorecard, and I think this is, you know, kind of along the lines of that question is that, you know, this person, I said, happy birthday, so they should say happy birthday. And, you know, the scorecard is always going to let you down. 
right? And all the focus only is going to be on, you know, keeping score and really not about what it means to you. You know, if you in, intentionally from a place of, you know, humbleness, you say happy birthday because you truly mean it. And the person never says happy birthday to you. You can walk away without any regrets. But if you are saying happy birthday, you know, like giving a gift with strings attached, then you are going to be let down. Maybe not that time, but eventually you are going to be let down. And so letting go again, letting go of the outcome is really important, especially when it comes to other people who we have no control of. And, and probably protecting yourself and keeping some distance from people who let you down and lowering the expectations with those people and really appreciating and bringing close to the people who are there for you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those are probably some of the things that you're going to be doing in your crushing it anxiety group that you can mm -hmm. teach people some of these great skills that you've developed in yourself over the years. Do you want to talk just a little bit about your group? Yeah, yeah, we have time because the meditation will be short anyway. So um, the crush anxiety group, it is called crush anxiety, but it is not the same as 30 days of crushing it that I talked about. <laughs> but I'm going to be <laughs> using a lot of that idea. So what 30 days of crushing it was basically all about is it was exposure, exposure therapy in a way, right? So I'll be bringing all of that knowledge that I have exposure about exposure to this six week group. It is a virtual group. We meet for one hour for six weeks. It starts on February 17th, which is a Wednesday evening. So for the six weeks after, we'll be talking about things like first, the physical symptoms of anxiety. They manifest differently in everybody. There's, there's tons, I'm, I'm still learning certain ways that people could be physically impacted by anxiety. And then we're looking at avoidance, you know, which we talked about already a little bit tonight, you know, um, why do we avoid things? What is it exactly that you are avoiding, right? And how could you approach that differently? And um, so physical symptoms, avoidance, and other things just concerning uh, more customized thoughts about your own anxiety. And, you know, there is room in that group for us to do some reflection. Where did my anxiety begin, maybe? You know, that's probably needs a few good sessions to actually figure that out. But this virtual group you know, we'll do exercises that will get you to start thinking about where your anxiety might have come from and why you're acting in those certain ways as, let's say, an adult. Great. Wow. Very well needed. Yes, absolutely. And you can get information for that on the Couple Synergy Community Facebook page or through the Connections Program. Right, mm -hmm. right. And so if you're not part of the, you know, community, the Couple Synergy Community group, um, join that. Um, if you're already on Facebook watching this, you just join the group. Um, that's where we have all the events and also discussions about the events as well. And if you're not on connections, you know, connections that we do this weekly webinar on connections, and then we just stream it live to Facebook. But, you know, there are a ton of other groups that are also uh, offered on connections, as well as the recordings of all of these weekly webinars. You can access all of them, mm -hmm. you know, which we've been going at this how many weeks now, Kench? I think 14 or something, maybe? Yes. Is this our 14th? Yeah, know. or our 15th. Maybe 15th. I don't know. So I'm taking a break from leading today so I can just enjoy the meditation. And Angie's going to guide us today. Okay, so um, what I want everyone to do right now, because sometimes it can be nice before I ask you to close your eyes, is just take a nice breath in and on your exhale, go ahead and start to stretch a bit. One way you could do this if you're sitting down like you two is just reach your arms up. Sort of extend your fingertips, give them a little squeeze and let your arms come back to your side. And when you're ready, take a breath and on your exhale, let your eyelids close. As your eyes are shut, 
Let any sounds around you just go in one ear and out the other. And as you're sitting here, notice your breath, whether it's quick or slow, whether it's shallow or deep, just remind yourself that your body is breathing exactly as it needs to in this moment. Allow your shoulders to be rested, your spine to be relatively straight and your head in a position that it would be in as if you were looking off toward the horizon. And when you're comfortable, allow your body to sink a little deeper into your chair, grounding for the moment, breathing a little deeper and letting any tension in your body release on your exhale. And in your mind's eye, as you're feeling calm in the moment, breathing as you need to, allow yourself to imagine a beautiful scene as you're outside of a very old castle. Notice the colors around you, the colors of the sky, of the trees, the stone, and how the castle you're standing in front of is so massively tall, so tall, the clouds are surrounding the top. As you're feeling grounded, and as you're feeling adventurous, remembering you are safe in this moment, breathing as you need to, walk up to the side of the castle and notice you come across a very large old ladder. Put your hands on the ladder and look up. It's so extremely long, you can't see the edge of it. You can't see the top of the castle you're in front of. But go ahead and start climbing. With your breath, go ahead and take each step, nice and steady, nice and slow putting your hands on each rung, grasping, moving up, breathing as you need to before you stop and look down. You're quite high, the trees around look different and the sky has started to change with clouds moving among it the colors of the sky slightly different as before because time moves so quickly. At the moment, allow any anxiety you have in your life to wash over you. Letting it move from the palms of your hand on the rungs of the ladder through your forearms, shoulders, your lungs, your lower back, snaking down your thighs, and finally to the tips of your toes and the arch of each foot. 
and just hold it for a moment. Remembering that with time, everything changes, including any physical sensations, any stress, any worry, any trauma. And begin to move up the ladder again, breathing a little deeper. With each exhale now, consciously release that tension from the palms of your hands and let it release from the arch in each foot, imagining you're pulling yourself up that ladder, pushing up with each step, breathing as you need to, feeling stronger until you reach the top and all you see is white with clouds around you, not being able to see the bottom. As you're at the tip of the ladder, climb over at the top of the castle and stand tall. Allow your arms to be stretched up towards the sky and enjoy your breath. With all the energy in your body, Notice how it feels, whether you can feel your heart beating or not. Your heart is beating because you are alive. And in this moment, you are safe. And in this moment, your body is breathing and working exactly as it needs to. Feel the victory at the top of this castle and notice again how the sky has changed. Take what you need from the top of this castle, whether it's courage, strength, confidence, or something else. Breathe a little deeper, absorbing that energy, reminding yourself you can revisit this place of energy, this place of safety, and this place of strength at any time. On your next breath in, Allow everything around you to disappear. Coming right back with your eyes still closed to the spot you're in. Feeling pulled towards the ground. Go ahead and put a hand over your heart. And just notice if you can feel your heart beating. With your hand, press gently into your chest, breathing a little deeper. And when you're re feeling centered and calm, Start to stretch your legs and arms, wiggle your toes. And when you're feeling strong and confident, gently open your eyes. Well, thank you for joining me during that meditation. 
Thanks for lovely. leading that meditation, Angie. Very cool. Ooh. Welcome. That was fun. Yeah. Well, thank you all for joining us today on Couple Synergy. And um, be sure to, you know, send us any questions or topic suggestions too. You guys can, you know, either send it through our, our Facebook page, Couple Synergy, or email us at contact at couplesynergy.com. Until next time. Until next time. Synergize your life and synergize your love. Bye.